Divine Truth Spirit Experience Experiences of people who have lived on earth and who have now passed into the spirit world. In this recording titled Interview Series with Author Afra Frederick Winterly, Mary channels Frederick Winterly, known as Afra or Astrael, the author of books channeled in the early 1900s titled Through the Mists, The Life Elysian, and The Gate of Heaven, who returns at Jesus' request to interview him about his life and his books channeled by Robert James Lees. Recorded on the 24th of October 2018 from 12 pm in Wilkesdale, Queensland, Australia. Session 2 Hello again, Mary and I are here again today doing some more mediumship. Today we're going to continue some discussion with Afra or Frederick Winterlay as it was called on Earth. And, uh, and we'll talk probably a bit more about how, the lead up to and also the, the actual delivery of the books that he was involved with producing in, in the start of the 20th century with uh, Robert James Lees, who was the person or the, or the medium who was channeling, channeling him at the time. So uh, welcome, Hafra. How, how are you today? Very well, that's very good. well. Yeah. What I was thinking we'd do today, if that's okay with you, is to um, just, if there were anything you would like to mention from, from yesterday's discussion, like that you'd like some clarification of first, if we can do that first, and then we can move into the actual um, material in the books and also your personal experiences that might not have even been mentioned in the books as well. Um, but I'd like to sort of take them one at a time, like through the mists first and then the life Elysian next and then the gate of heaven. And so it might be a number of conversations we have about the different thing, the different books as, uh, that were produced by Robert James Lees. Certainly. If we can start first by asking you whether there was anything you'd like to add about your personal experience uh, that was on earth. Remember... Uh, in our previous discussion, we were talking um, a lot about, as for the sake of our listeners, we were talking a lot about your life on earth and how that influenced your passing and, and how that influenced your desires and, and the different things, developments on earth that occurred that caused your nature or your, or your character to be modified or formed the way it was. So I was just wondering whether you had any other things you'd like to add to that before we progress into the discussion about the actual channeling with Robert and, and the books themselves? I think that it's, it is very difficult to fully convey, for example, the, the exact things that make up one's motivation mm. on earth. Mm. And so... The soul is complex, no, isn't it? It is. Yeah. No matter what conversation we have, it will always remain incomplete. Of course. I'm happy to be questioned or guided by your listeners as you mentioned yesterday as to my life's experiences on earth and afterwards well perhaps we might ask a few just personal details about your life on earth uh, before we proceed then um first thing is that uh, what what job did you do when you're on earth it wasn't required of me to have full-time a full-time job yep. but i did work as a librarian right i enjoyed books and so I did, I did spend some time as a librarian. And what caused some of your friends to borrow books from your father? Because that was one thing that was mentioned in, in Through the Mist. They wished to read the books? <laughs> yeah, but I'm, I mean, why did they come to you to borrow those books? Like, why, why, why didn't they go directly to your father? Well, naturally, I was more approachable. And my father was uh, occupied by his business often. So what was your father's business? He was involved in trade, yes, in a sort of um, a job involving uh, merchant trade. Yes. Uh, involving shipping. Right, so like what would be classified as an import-exporter nowadays. <laughs> perhaps, perhaps. Like that. <laughs> there, there isn't a... He was essentially a businessman. Yeah, yeah. What about your older brother and sister? What, what did they finish up doing? Again, it should be said that there was some wealth inherited by my family and there was somewhat of a dependence in both my brother and sister upon my father. Uh, but my brother did 
He was interested in becoming a physician and he did do some training in that regard, but was never fully a practicing doctor. My sister married. I suppose that would have been normal back then too for a wealthy or a semi fairly wealthy woman to marry rather than have a job of some kind. Yes, I wouldn't say that we would have been classed as exceedingly wealthy, but there were some funds and some some attitude of of wishing to have a a more um, societal and gentlemanly life in my, especially in my brother. And uh, and how did how did you meet Claire on Earth? In the library. In the library, she came in, obviously. Yeah, there you go. So that's uh, so it's just a simple meeting initially. Yes. And and did both of you express interest in each other at the time, or? Uh, not immediately. No, yeah. she came often to the library, and yeah. we we formed a friendship, and yeah. certainly, we both had. Uh, feeling of affection for each other mm-hmm. uh, that was beyond that of the casual acquaintance from mm. our first meeting. But it took some time to develop, uh, perhaps to develop the courage to uh, initiate a courtship. And in, your, in the books there, are, there is a mention about your dad having passed uh, because you actually talk about your dad a bit and then you say, he is here now and you know, he obviously feels a bit different about some of these things. But I was wondering how long after your passing did your dad pass? Hmm, it's not a sum that I usually equate. Uh, some 10 years. Okay, so it wasn't that long. And it, may, it may have been slightly longer, in fact. Right, yeah, yes. yeah. How did you catch up with him again to actually make that mention? Like, is it... Did he want to see you, or did did you just visit him, or what? How, how what happened there? This was initiated by me. Right. So if it was up to him, he probably would have <laughs> left it. A while. Yes. Yeah, some changes happened in my father, and in fact, it wasn't ten years after I passed that he passed. It was much, well, not much longer, but in the period of fifteen. Yeah. Yes. To. to mm, 15 years, yes. Yeah. It took some time for my father to make changes. And so I did see him. He went through a period of staying in his same condition, really, as he was on the earth, quite arrogant and angry. And then he did has gone through a period of feeling quite... Um, Remorseful. No, no, it's not right to say remorseful. <laughs> okay. Regretful. Regretful. Yeah. And sheepish somewhat. But So ashamed ashamed ashamed, ashamed. of so, so obviously there's a recognition of some of the sin without the full repentance for the sin. That's correct. Which is and very many common. people go through this <laughs> yeah. space yeah. after they enter the spirit life and Certainly. so in, when he was in that space he still had no desire to see me. It is most accurate to say that when he first passed and remained in the same condition, then he had a desire to me, but to see me. But I, I didn't, I didn't make my presence known to him, although I visited him. Then in the second phase, he had no desire to see me, because it would have brought about his shame, or triggered his shame. Uh, but since then, he has made further changes. He still does not enjoy. A, a wondrous place in the in the uh, by Earth standards. So, is he? What sphere is he in? Still, first sphere. In the lower part of the second sphere. Lower part, second. Yeah. So basically, he he is now where you arrived. Yes. Or close yes. to where you arrived. Not quite at the yes. Yeah. Very close. Yeah. Yeah. Keep in mind for your listeners that. The experiences that I had immediately following my passing were in various spheres. Yes, where they where so my exp- he does not share the same experiences as myself, of or have met the same people, or who have visited uh, the the corral or, or yeah. any of s- such places. It is more that he's in a place of rest. So he lacks the interest to and the desire for truth to be involved in those other things that you were involved in. 
Yes, at this stage, mm. at mm. this stage. Mm. And, and my, as we mentioned yesterday, my desire for truth was quite a strong, strongly developed quality mm. within myself mm. at the time of my passing, which enabled many very rapid experiences and a variety of mm. experiences quite soon after my passing. Most people, even if they have some interest in truth, do not experience such a vast array of experiences or encounters. Uh, they are taken at a much slower pace through their learning because their le that is dependent upon how strong their desire for that learning is. So for my father, at his point in his progress, he is really in a place of rest. He does not yet seek exceptionally strongly for truth as I did. He will, he will be assisted uh, at this, he is being assisted to learn certain truths, but there is still elements of uh, resistance, as you are aware, and, mm. and shock at learning certain things that some people uh, are quite allowing of that experience and mm. allow that to, to enable them to grow more rapidly. But for him, as he is right now, there will still be a, what I predict to be quite a, a slow pace. Of course, it may change yeah. according to his choices. If we look at his, uh, at his, uh, I suppose you could say at his life compared to your own, basically he is really not yet at the place where you were in terms of the desire or hunger for truth. No. Uh, uh, even though his condition has changed enough for him to, to allow him to be in a similar location, mm -hmm. his, his desire and, and hunger for truth and, and desire to love are not, are not fully formed really at this stage. So, That's correct. And mm. perhaps this is another um, time to explain a little bit more about the, the spirit's fears. Mm. Um, mm. There is not so much language. Uh, I understand that there's a lot of language that you use to convey the concepts to people on Earth about yes. the spheres. Yes. It's not really referred to in, in the same way here um, because so much is understood through experience and so much needs little explanation because it is an experience-based learning. Uh, however... For example, while I entered into a state of the second sphere, my surroundings and locations were governed by my, my personal desires and aspirations, even in that place, and my, my personality to a large degree. My home was, was, uh, in, was directly a result of that. But also the places that I went within that uh, spiritual location were governed by that. Whereas my father lives in a, an entirely different physical location in terms of appearance because he is quite a different, has quite a different character and nature to myself. And so um, when one says, oh, y your father is in the same location, I, I think it's wonderful for listeners to learn that it, it may not look exactly the same. This condition really is a condition of love or, or, or truth within one's soul and it is still the, the, the experience of that space is still governed by personal desires mm. and, and the, the, the progress to different places uh, and even journeys within that same location will not be identical for any person because yeah, no, and perhaps we can liken it to a bit like on Earth, isn't it? That you can have a whole heap of people living in Australia, but you know, who who of them will travel to another place in Australia? Even well, it depends t totally upon their desires and you know what they want to do with their life and so forth. Yes, and perhaps we could liken it to the equator. There yeah, are many people yeah. on the same line who <laughs> who live all around the world on the lo on the equator. Yeah, there are, there are some similarities. There yeah. are certainly some similarities, for, to use the physical Earth-based example yeah. of temperature, for yeah. example, yeah. and certain weather phenomenon. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> there are many variations yes, in terms of highly affluent housing or... and wealth <laughs> well. and, and all of those things. And while it is not a direct analogy yeah. with the spheres, yeah. uh, perhaps that gives people some, some way to relate to the concept. 
And also, should a person move from the equator to a different latitude is entirely dependent upon that person's desire. The person's desire, the choices that they make. And so um, while my father can be at the same location I was when I passed, whether or not he moves from that location uh, is entirely up to him. And I think this was well described by the example of my mother. Yes, definitely. And and I suppose if I, wanted to get, I wanted to get to the subject of your mother, but if we could just stay with your father for a bit longer. I, I think at this stage it's important for, for our listeners to understand that um, when you're in a, like, a, there's, two, there's a diff, big difference between condition and desire. Oftentimes condition determines desire, but, but it, the way the love part of your life is measured is based, basically on what is your condition right now and what is your desire for your future. Mm. When you arrived in the, uh, in the spirit world, obviously you had a set condition which was, uh, enabled you to be in the second sphere, but, but you also had some highly developed desires which were far beyond your condition mm. uh, in terms of in terms of desires to know things about God, desires to know things you know, more truth, desires to understand how to share truth with others and even communicate on earth. A lot of spirits don't have those desires and so, so they don't have those experiences. Yeah. Yes, mm. yes, exactly. And I was reflecting as you spoke about the, the commonly, or perhaps uncommonly, there is a large disparity... <laughs> Let me say this more correctly. Yeah. Commonly, there is a small disparity or, or a, not a large contrast between one's will and one's desire, Correct. which is what you were speaking of just now. But then there are those who have quite a disparity between those two. So, for example... And I feel you're, you were probably in that class of people. <laughs> perhaps, perhaps. I, th- I think I was very fortunate to, to pass in the condition that I did. Yes. I, yes. Because I had made some choices, and, and this is something that I do speak with Mary about often, is about the, the impact of a person's choices while on earth, how that so markedly uh, impacts the person's condition after their passing. Yes. So the my small seemingly very small choices in harmony with morality and in disharmony with my my family or society's lack of ethics stood me in amazing stead when i entered this life and i was very fortunate because very few people really make those kinds of decisions when they're upon the earth um, but the, the impact of those seemingly small choices had an amazing impact when I came here because obviously my, as you say, yes, perhaps it is correct, as you say, my will, my desire and my aspiration had to be very well developed in order for me to make those choices. And in order for you to fight the status quo of, of, the, of the, you know, environment of Earth that you were living in, yes. you know, in order to be different, you already had to have quite a strongly developed desire, which, which is not a normal thing for many people who pass, is it? It, it isn't, no. but it is quite wondrous when we see a person enter into the hells and have just perhaps one small experience which ignites a very strong desire for, for truth or love or God and this disparity between their conditions between their desire and their... their and their actual will-based yeah. or soul-based condition. Condition. Yeah. Uh, ensures such a rapid change. So, for example, yeah. a person who enters the hell with such a disparity may rapidly overtake someone who enters the second Six, sphere. Or even the sixth sphere if they could. Have, yes, know, often that is without such a disparity. <laughs> yeah. It's a marvellous. It's a marvellous redeeming capacity that God has built into the soul, I yeah. feel. And, and perhaps what we need to do at this stage is mention uh, desire on earth because it, 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 it seems, and, and this is mentioned in many channelings, but also when we channeled to Paget and the Paget messages and so forth, we mentioned this thing that if you don't learn the uh, necessity for desire to drive your life while you're on earth, Frequently what happens when you pass is it takes many, many, many years 
to develop desires in any direction. Mm. As you so correctly stated in one of the books, um, there are many places of the hells of the spirit world which are, which are filled with people who are without desire, um, who basically they're just living a life like they were sort of living it on earth and they don't have much of a desire for change. Mm-hmm. And, and it's only time generally that affects those people, you know, and the assistance of, you know, loving people helping them that eventually convince them to change. Yes. Yeah. And that's a, that's a sad thing, I feel. The second thing I'd like to mention about your dad, though, in regard to this progress is it, I think most people on earth don't understand that when you've gone through, when you've arrived in the, in the first sphere of the spirit world, and usually in, a, in a, a various conditions, but usually it's about, you know, it, it is a hellish sort of a condition the average person would probably arrive. I mean, when I say average, it, you know, of course everyone has a different experience. But when you arrive, usually the law, God's laws, sort of, you feel a bit battered by them because you're so resistant mm. to the law. Mm. You feel battered by them. So by the time you've worked through your condition, uh, your unloving condition and entered the second sphere, you are almost like in a tired state, aren't you? Like a, for, for those people who've gone through that process, mm-hmm. you're usually in a sort of a tired state. They go, wow, I'm so, I'm so thankful that's over sort of thing. And, that, <laughs> and, and also brief. there has been so much... As you say, opposition to their to their which is the cause of their real cause of their exhaustion yeah. state. Yes, yeah. that so there's opposition to their will and yeah. their condition enforced by the environment. Yes, and they fight that even. And yes. so, yes, you're very very correct that yeah. it becomes quite a a trial or a, or an arduous journey to yes. reach that second sphere yeah. condition. So, so now that your dad is in the second sphere condition, you can see that he, he'd probably, there's a high likelihood he might even stay there for a, a long time. Yes. Um, because, he, because he's sort of uh, working through issues of tiredness, exhaustion, his own fighting and all those kind of issues. Exactly. So frequently a person who's, who's sort of been, uh, I, I suppose you could say, motivated only by the law <laughs> to progress mm. is still very resistive to desire. To progress, yes. and and this is what causes a deep stagnation in their development mm. in the spirit world. Yes, it's it's very underestimated the the benefit of desire. Yeah. I know, mm. I know that Mary often uh, tries to blame her desire for her her difficulties, but and bemoans the fact that of the differential between yeah, uh, desire and uh, condition will. and desire. <laughs> but in fact, uh, it is a great asset mm-hmm. to develop one's desire. The, the uh, difficulties that are encountered or the, the, the pain, the pain and fear that is encountered when one develops a desire in disharmony with their will uh, is a necessary part of growth and when... And actually, speeds speedens growth. It, yeah. it makes it more rapid. But because one is consciously engaged and cannot blame an external, <laughs> <laughs> then often the, the great tragedy is when a person tries to diminish their loving will in yeah. order to avoid the the fear or uh, rage that is. Um, uncovered yeah. when they when they establish such a desire. Yeah, and so um, and this is something we notice a lot on Earth too. Is this um, the 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 engagement, if you could call it, of the war of resistance, mm. and then the detrimental effects that has upon your own development and your own life, and then you start measuring that, and you call that, and and this is what we notice many doing with divine truth. They call the problem with that divine truth is the problem, rather than seeing it as no, it's not God's truth that's the problem. No, it's it's the fact that you're fighting it and you're fighting this emotional process. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So it would be right to say, would it, with regard to your father, that he's probably not got a relationship with God at this stage. No. No. So he's still going through that what we've been terming the natural love path. Yes, and and even even with resistance. <laughs> well. <laughs> It's it's interesting, isn't it? Because mm. uh, it is possible to traverse the lower spheres without 
making a conscious decision yes. a- about which path. Yes. Really, as you've just mentioned, in most people emerge from the first fear due to their desire eventually being molded and beaten by the law. <laughs> by, beaten by the law. Yeah. Yes, and so it's not fair, I don't feel, to say that there's any path chosen by a person no. at that point. That sort of new path neutral, I think you can yes, say. They, they are they lovingly are. being moved, moved towards a state of greater happiness Yes, uh, through the operation of this wonderful spirit life. That God has created for us. Like still so are. I couldn't say I'm 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 fascinated to know if he will express a desire for God mm. once he emerges from this recuperative state. Yes, and and if we give you a bit of background about your dad, because I think he was a deacon or something in the church, wasn't yes. he? Yes. Yeah. So so you know, isn't that interesting? A person who's proclaims a religious faith on earth and and seems to adhere to it on earth, or gives the impression of adhering to it on earth has no heart for it <laughs> and in the end uh, the relationship with god completely neglected that's that's correct and but also it's true to say that most people are exceptionally shocked upon their passing and so yeah. um they believe in fact that they have been pleasing god in mm. whatever way they perceive god to be yeah. <laughs> uh, and and many of them don't stop even to think of god because Established in them is not the kind of... It, it, I think I would love to say to your listeners that many people believe that they can long for God without longing for truth. <laughs> <laughs> and many people believe that they, they don't have a longing for God and yet if they have established within them a strong longing for truth... They do actually have they a bit do. Of a for God. In fact, <laughs> it, it, while they may not conceptualize it that way, mm. and it is not to depersonalize God, but it, really the the margin between a heartfelt longing for a personal relationship for God and a heartfelt longing for truth on all matters, including including personal, uh, in a, in a universal truth, a desire for a universal truth about oneself and everything. That those two places are very, very close together. And what I notice is that many people believe that they have a longing for God while rejecting truth. Which is actually universal. an impossibility. Yes, yeah. it is. And then many, well, not so many people long for truth but feel at odds with God. Yeah, yeah. Um, but there are certain people who, due to their own misconceptions about God still feel that they're at odds with God when in fact my experience demonstrates how I <laughs> my my affinity with universal truth was it was such an affirmation for me to enter this life and understand that that universal truth was not only that I had hoped was true that yeah. my logic said was true was not only reality but that God, this immensely loving God, um, was so much a part of that. Yeah, and perhaps we need to say why that's the case to our listeners too, because I think most people don't understand that truth is, is one of God's major attributes. Mm. And, and I feel that, you know, if they understood that truth was a major attribute of God, that it's actually impossible to have a relationship with God unless you also really desire truth you know in, mm. at, at that level because because it's a fundamental attribute of god's character and you know i've just sort of feel that most people don't really get that they think love is the fundamental a- attribute mm. of god's character which is true of course but but they think that love and truth can operate in complete disharmony with each other yes. you know this constant concept on earth that you can lie or misrepresent the truth or withhold the truth and still love somebody. Mm-hmm. And, and you know, obviously that's not the case in our relationship with God. And God also knows it's not the case in our relationship with people either. It's just a flawed view or, or a facade-based view of our life. Mm. Yeah. Yes, and so we were discussing a person's entry into the, to the spirit life. So, for example, mm. my father who had a position in his church and you, you made a remark about the lack of regard or the lack of even thought for God yeah. when one enters it. So I, I suppose if, what I wanted to say about that was that there is 
a sense when when a person is on earth that they so in my father's example the the heartfelt feeling for either god or truth was not present and many people on earth feel that they know their hearts but as you know that is very often not the case but this establishment of any heart-based longing even the teenager who has a heart-based longing non-addictive a heart-based longing for for their girlfriend <laughs> uh, is actually closer to a state which will cause them to progress much more rapidly in the spirit life because they're connected to this feeling within themselves which is a longing and yearning and the majority of people on earth by the time they reach 13 or 14 are disconnected from heart-based longings yeah. and as a result they are actually quite disconnected from a true longing not only for god but for truth and for love because there is there really is a scientific nature to the emotional state to the soul-based state of longing and while it is wonderful that people think certain things or feel these aspirations that we're speaking about when when a person um, resists or doesn't develop an aspiration to to connect to longing at a heart-based level they retard their growth quite severely which is basically what your father has been doing yes so yeah. so that is so for my father it's not correct to say that he hasn't had a thought of god since passing no. and that even some of his thoughts have not been angry but rather pleading or or or, or avoiding <laughs> the law <laughs> yes it's very common for people to common. go through a process of feeling the law is harsh or yeah. they don't understand it at law as law at the time yeah. uh, but sometimes sort of feeling but not in a very deep heart-based sense yes. that oh perhaps i have done something wrong yeah. <laughs> um but the the true assistance really comes to those who have who are willing to embrace a heart-based longing and i see this many times with mm. the spirits that you assist here in this studio yes that those who come those and I know people question who, why are they coming, and how is it easy for them? And yeah, what? why is it so easy? They <laughs> they keep saying, why is it so easy for them? Does that mean it's easier in the spirit world for us yes. to progress? And and yes. obviously they're just seeing the end result of a certain condition being developed. <laughs> that's that's right. There's there is usually a very strong heart based longing for change of some sort. Exactly. So even those in the hells that you speak with, uh, even those who are initially resistive and fighting you very often they're connected to themselves firstly on a very emotional heart-based level yeah that their, their emotions are very raw raw yeah. so even if their yearning is towards <laughs> sin yeah. that is you you can uh, your spirit friends who guide these people to you can know that there is a point of connection and usually as you know when one is very much connected to the emotionality of their sin, if I may call it that, uh, the emotions that their sin is driven by, there is often avenues for rapid change because there is no more denial of the actual emotional content driving the action or the desire. And I suppose we should say to our listeners that all of you who believe that the spirit world is easier to make progress in, um, I'm sure once you arrive there, you'll probably see that it's not. Because if, if you don't have some very strongly developed desires or by the time you've passed, um, it's very difficult to develop those desires when you're surrounded by everybody else who has exactly the same desires as you. I, I think it's, it's a wonderful thing that God has yeah. created. And I would, I would say that very often that it's not dissimilar. I, I say that many times in the books. It's not dissimilar. Progress yeah. can be difficult. It can be very difficult for anyone here on earth and in the spirit life if they have no aspiration to change, no longing for truth and no longing for God. It will be difficult. Progression will be difficult yes. because one is at the mercy of law rather than engaging with the provision for a loving desire, provisions made for those with a loving desire. 
So uh, I would almost say it is neither more easy or more difficult yeah. in the spirit life. That's right. To progress. Uh, and I, I suppose, you know, it's, it's a bit like a person on earth, let's say he's living with a, let's say he himself is a drunkard and he's living with a group of drunkards. Obviously, that's going to be very, more difficult for him to get out of his drunkenness than if, it, that if he's living with a group of people who don't want him to be a drunkard, <laughs> you know, because there is yes. this external pressures, obviously, trying to lift him up from his current condition. And many drunks, where do they hang out? In the bar. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. Surrounded by people who share their desires. desires. And so, you know, if we can sort of liken it like that in, in some ways, it might help our, our listeners to understand that when spirits come to us who have spent sometimes hundreds and sometimes even thousands of years in a, in a difficult place in the spirit world, you know, where they're going through this process of developing desire, when, by the time they come to us, even if it's just to argue, there is at least the desire to argue, <laughs> which you can work with, you know, after that yes. point. But Yes, and many people exist or here on earth or in the spirit life quite disconnected from their, their, their emotions, their yeah. true heart, I'm calling it in this discussion today. Sure. But yeah. their, their, their emotional essence that is driving whatever they do, whatever they choose, and so many times it's true that spirits in the spirit life have desires that they are not really emotionally aware of. The soul is operating and they are wishing to, to remain separate uh, in terms of their awareness from how they are using their choices and decisions. And we've talked to, talked to many people about this sort of separation that occurs between the emotion and the thought processes, eh? Hey? And, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, that's one thing we're still trying to help people understand that just because you think a certain thing, it doesn't mean you actually feel that particular thing. Yes. And, and for many people in these discussions, it is quite, like, difficult for them to come to terms with the fact that maybe their actions are being guided by their feelings rather than their thoughts that they, you know, and so that's, that's interesting in itself, whereas when I noticed when you passed, a lot of your actions and your decisions were all governed by pretty much your, your feelings, like mm -hmm. in terms of what you wanted, you, you wanted to do this and you wanted to do that and you wanted to know and, 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 and these things were feelings in you, not just, oh, I, I, I'd like to know that type of <laughs> but, a, it's, but a desire yes. present as an emotion. There is a difference, isn't there, between mm. thinking, oh, I, I Perhaps wonder, I'd like to know. <laughs> I wonder what that's about. Yeah. I wonder why I'm here or I wonder why this has happened to yeah. a childlike fascination and urgency. Yes, I, I've understand. really got to know. Yeah. <laughs> what is happening here? <laughs> yeah. Yes, yeah. and that, that latter state is really the state that I was in when I entered the spirit life. Yeah, so, so perhaps now we can move across to mum, because the reason why I'm, I'm having this discussion, I want to have this discussion with you about mum and dad, is I, I want to help people on earth understand that they, they don't really sometimes get how much influence the emotional or soul-based condition of the parents has had on the development of their life, even if the development of the life was in the opposite direction of the parents. And so if we can talk a little bit about mum, Obviously, you described a fair bit about mum in, in the books, so, so the readers of the books would understand that, that your mum had a couple of children and then died at childbirth with yourself. She wasn't that connected to your father because she was basically, there was a bit of a barter system between her father and, and, your, and your father, yes. uh, her husband, about you know, providing some wealth in turn for the exchange of the marriage. Mm -hmm. um, which obviously would, would have been very upsetting for her emotionally. Um, and when you met her in the second sphere, where, where she already was, I gather, I gather she was in the same place, was she, as, as yourself? Or was she in a better condition than when you arrived? She was in a very similar condition to yeah. myself when I arrived. So, and she had died, like, obviously 40 or so years earlier. Yes. So, um, and, and her, her condition wasn't anywhere near as bad as your father's condition, even when she passed. 
But as you mentioned, there was sort of in the in the gate of heaven, I think you mentioned it, this sort of indolent uh, attitude that can develop in a person where they, they've gone through, they're in a place, you could say the place of rest, I mm -hmm. suppose you could call it, where, um, you know, they are just now happy with their circumstances with very... With, with not a very strong desire to change them. And is, it seems to me that that's how your mother was when you first met her. Was that the case? Yes, mm. that's the mm. case. So she had passed in um, a better condition than my father, but a somewhat lesser condition than the one that I encountered her in. She had a great deal of grief to, to release and uh, shock at her passing and a sense of regret about her life on earth in terms of the marriage and in terms of also feeling that her full potential on earth or her full desires on earth were not fulfilled because her life was ended uh, before she wanted... Her, her, she, she passed in childbirth, obviously, mm, mm. and so she, she had um, a desire to to be with me, her newborn son, mm. and to, to see her children grow and mature on earth. And so there was quite a bit of shock for her. And unlike yourself, she would not have understood at that time that she could easily spend time with you and all those kind of things. That's correct. Yeah. And, and her very emotions themselves prevented her having a, a ready uh, ability to visit me on earth. She was able to, and she did guide me in some sense during yeah. my life on earth, but it took her some years. Um, so, so initially upon entering the spirit world, she was assisted a great deal with her grief and shock and sense of regret or sense of unfulfilled potential. And that that was quite substantial obviously her own relationship with her own father was quite painful and yes. and she had a lot of grief there that she had never um obviously Worked experienced through. before and so following all of that she at the time that i met her she had felt that her life really to that point had been quite traumatic mm. many traumatic events really and even her passing felt like a trauma to her. And yes. so she hadn't, she was in a sense just very relieved to be in a place where she no longer felt such sorrow or such loss and such shock. Yes. And that's why she was very content to be in the state that she was in. So, in some ways, content to, it was sort of similar contentment to your father in some ways about being in that state, but. Obviously, she had some different emotions relating to God and other subjects that uh, than your father has had. Certainly. Yeah. And for my mother, when I met her, that was the happiest that she had ever been in her entire life. Yes. And uh, until that point. And so the desire to just remain there and enjoy that uh, was very strong. And the fear of further trauma had not left her, really. And so the, the sense... It, the sense of aspiration of aspiration for change was not developed in her because there was still some association between aspiration and potential trauma. And this is, I suppose, one thing too, that a person on earth needs to come to terms with the fact that emotional growth means a release of emotional, <laughs> of emotional pain as well as uh, get it, receiving or feeling positive emotions. And, yes. and I sort of feel like a lot of people get very hung up on the pain side of it and as a result of that, they're even fearful that any new, new condition will result in just more emotional pain. But all it does is just expose the condition further, doesn't it? And, yes. and, and it's actually a very beneficial process. It's like, it's like I often say to Mary and others that um, you just got to get used to overwhelming emotion. <laughs> if, you, if, you, if, if you can enjoy that process, you'll be fine with, with your progress. Yeah. So uh, with your mum, um, when she, when, when uh, she, dur during this 40-year uh, period, basically, 40, 40 or so year period, where she arrived in the first sphere of the spirit world, slowly worked through these painful emotions that she obviously had help and assistance to help her work through those things, um, but obviously wouldn't have had a very strong desire to uh, during that period to probably work through them in a proactive way. She probably wouldn't have 
Is that true? She didn't sort of understand the process too much at the beginning? No, yeah. as is common for as most common, people. Yeah. Yeah. There's, there's such little education on Earth, which is why <clears throat> yeah. I wanted to share the books. So, yes, she, she wasn't as resistive to the process as my father of change and growth, but certainly she didn't understand really how to, to hasten her growth either. Now, during this 40-year period, obviously, uh, once she realised that she could communicate with you as a spirit, mm -hmm. how, how, how did she... One of the questions I'd like to ask is, how, how did she try to influence you during that period? Because obviously the, the attempt to influence you would have been different uh, as she progressed. And then, and then how did you feel that influence when you were on Earth, if we could sort of talk about it from both directions? Uh, perhaps I could answer the second question first. Sure. Uh, I was not consciously aware of her influence, uh, but I did experience, I, in hindsight, I, I understood that at times in my longing or grief for her, um, when I felt a sense, I, I really felt a sense of her presence. Yes, yes. <laughs> but I, I didn't consciously say, she's here yeah. uh and also she was very fond of claire and really encouraged me towards that courtship i really felt that i wasn't much of a catch for any woman yeah. <laughs> and uh unfortunately my experience with claire um sort of reinforced that experience yes yeah. yes um, but she she did attempt to influence me towards that courtship. Did, you, did your mother know that Claire was your soulmate at that time? It's difficult to say that she knew we were soulmates. Yeah. There, she would have known there's some similarity connection, wouldn't she? Yes. Yeah. The, 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 the fact is that very often the issue of, of soulmates is partially understood in yeah. the lower realms of the spirit life, uh, but not completely. And so she could sense that there was some affinity be between our natures and that, that we would fit together very well. Um, but she, she, and I'm fairly sure she would not have even said that she understood that. The more she acted on her, what she would have perhaps thought, just what seemed right. Hmm. It's interesting that for most spirits in the lower realms, there is very little uh, logical analysis of, of most uh, of course, actions. Of course, and this I, I think I think a lot of people don't understand that. Mm -hmm. Even people who have heard divine truth don't really understand a lot that that what you can hear a lot of things, that, but it's just information unless there's some emotional connection to the logic of it all and and also some love and truth-based connection to the logic of it all and even as we discussed a little yesterday in regards to myself an aspiration to criti critically analyze oneself oneself yeah so with your mum uh, the reason why i bring up this influence part of your mum is that in your observations because you, you also had the opportunity even throughout the books had the opportunity to examine the influences that spirits place upon people on earth and and this is a common thing for a person who wants to know about that obviously but again if you don't want to know then you don't get to know those things but you wanted to know and so um how, like if you think about your mum's influence over you it, it was relatively benign yes uh, it, during even during her darkest periods yes. it was relatively benign perhaps in some of her darker periods the, the sense of my loss of her was, in fact, heightened yes. because she also felt this great loss. Um, and some of my opposition to my father... Certainly came from her. Came from her. Yes. But, but in terms of uh, influencing you down a dark path or a, or a road that, you know, you know, was going to be negative for your progress... There wasn't a strong influence in that direction. No, it, I was fortunate, I suppose, that yeah. she was not a spiteful person on earth. Yes. So she didn't encourage me in spite, yes. in, towards a spiteful uh, state at any point. Uh, much influence towards spite is, uh, is given, is, is uh, 
the result of, of spirits. spirits. Yeah. And this brings us to that point of, uh, like, for many people who are in these conflict zones of, of the world at the moment, mm-hmm. they obviously do, you know, they don't understand how much their unwillingness to forgive the people they're in conflict with is driven by the unwillingness of their spirit parents or great parents or, or familial ancestors. ancestors. Yes. Um, how much of their influence is being brought to bear to refuse this process of forgiveness. That's very true. So you also didn't have that high amount of influence from your mother, but in your observations of others, um, have you found that, that, that there is a fair bit of influence coming from that family when they're in that dark condition? Probably more. Uh, most than, certainly. More than most your experience with your own mother. Most people are... are highly influenced by their their family members who have passed and a great majority of the both negative and positive if we may call it such because we don't speak in such so we say strong loving, loving or unloving influences yes and also i would like to clarify that there perhaps i finished my sentence sure, and then yeah, i will yeah, clarify further. what loving and unloving actually is <laughs> uh, if i could say that the vast majority of influence of any kind around any person does come from their family line uh, mm. for the vast majority of people perhaps mm. i could say because mm. there are some instances where people feel um, a sense of disconnection from family but even then that does not mean that their ancestors who have passed or their, their family line who have passed feel that same disconnection towards themselves. Yes. In fact, most are extremely interested due in their, their living relatives or the people who are living on earth, their mm. relatives. And that's because there are large constructs around emotionally around family, uh, as you are well aware, within almost every human in existence. Uh, those those who have incarnated anyway. And now I would like to talk about the nature of, the, of influence. Mm. Because it is such that people are influenced by individuals who have lived on earth before, their spirits, and each one is an individual, it is not correct to say for the majority of people that the influence that they receive from a family member is at any one point entirely, oh no, I need to be careful. It is very often that at any one point the influence they receive from an individual is not entirely unloving or entirely unloving. Entirely loving, yeah. Yes, yes. 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 loving or unloving. Yeah. So there may be family members around people who have a very loving feeling and understanding of God's truth, sometimes by accident, uh, on a certain matter, and they will influence their their living relative about that. But then, conversely, they may have spite about certain issues or a strong, firmly unchallenged belief within themselves that is in a very unloving or untruthful or flawed, from God's perspective, uh, uh, definition. And so then the influence we could say there is unloving. But I, I notice in your listeners that many times they feel there are dark spirits and light spirits, mm-hmm. loving, uh, unloving spirits and loving spirits. And this is a dangerous, this is dangerous. Because people don't sort of realise that even the darkest of spirits do have some loving tendency. And, and even some of the brightest spirits, particularly those on the natural love path, do have some very unloving tendencies. Yes. <laughs> and then there are those who, who, who are in spirit who share a, quite a similar condition to the person who is on earth. That's right. And that may not be hellish, but it may not be particularly bright. And it is, it's similar to the disparity between uh, will and desire that we spoke of earlier. When there's not much disparity... The influence, while it is there and can be either damaging or positive, it's is not as noticeable. And also has very little bearing on the person's choice and decisions. Because they were going to make those choices and decisions anyway. anyway. It's often what I see is that a person who has a spirit friend or a spirit guide or even a spirit relative who is in quite a, a brighter condition, comparatively speaking, 
they find it difficult to communicate with the person they are attempting to guide yes. or, or communicate with. And to some degree, so do highly negative spirits yes. find it difficult to influence a person who has some established ethics and morality or beliefs in harmony with God uh, that they are unwilling to compromise. That's the key. <laughs> it is, it's about the, the willingness to compromise yes. because of fear or shame or anger. If, if a person has a willingness to compromise, then the dark influence is possible. Well, that, uh, a person who's willing prevalent. to compromise, it, it would be correct to say, could be influenced in any direction, can't they? They, 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 they you know, can. Like Paul said in the, in the, as a quote, was it Paul, I think, I oh, know it might have been my brother James, who said about the, uh, you know, being driven by the waves of the sea, you know, a person who's in a doubting condition is like being driven by the waves of the sea. And this mm. is what a lot of humanity is like, isn't it? It, it is correct. Yeah. That is yeah. true. Um, but there is a difference between a person who is really almost blank in terms of their character development, and that yeah. is that they um, they haven't just really haven't developed a strong idea of what they think is right and wrong. Because in those cases, the operation of the conscience can help; it can guide a person. But then there are the cases where people feel. And this does darken their condition, obviously, which creates less disparity between them and, their, and the, the, those and the spirits with spirit the influence. darkest uh, yeah. aspirations. But those who feel, look, this is right and this is wrong, except when I don't want to feel this, or <laughs> except yeah. when yeah. I want what I want, except when it might cause me a slight bit of discomfort, then, as the saying goes, all bets are off. Yeah. Now, those people, dark spirits, can influence very easily. Uh, well, again, it's not correct to say it very easily. It depends on in what direction, doesn't it? It depends degree. on the direction, and it also depends on the life circumstance of the person. Of course. And the moment-by-moment -moment choices. And this is really the main point that I wanted to make surrounding spirits and how they influence people on Earth, is that... While influence exists, if a person is responsible, willing to be responsible, as in willing to be, if a person is responsible and wants to be responsible for their personal choices, then they are, they are always responsible for their personal choices is the first point. Yeah, and so it's just whether they want to be or it's not. It's <laughs> whether they want to be or not. And if a person does want to be, then very little then spirit influence becomes much more difficult. It's, I say this because many of your listeners attempt to blame influence for their actions. Mm. And this is, this is actually exposing something about their own condition, which is that they don't wish to be responsible for their actions and they're in opposition with God uh, in terms of law, which makes every person responsible for their actions. And we could say on the issue of responsibility for actions that many times our desire to not be responsible is because we want somebody else to be responsible. And this, of course, is a deep attractor to spirits who influence us. If, and, and what we've noticed uh, with many people is the higher their desire that somebody else is responsible for their life, yes. the higher amount of negative spirit influence they actually receive. But they are also a bit like pendulums because you, if you get them in an environment where the only kind of influence they're receiving up is positive, then they swing in the other direction mm -hmm. as well. But as soon as the environment changes, they back in the, you know, and, and it, it must be for them a very difficult life in a lot of ways. The way I see it is because, it, because there's no consistency in that. And, and then what I notice is they start blaming what they're learning for this inconsistent swinging rather than seeing it as their own state of desiring other people to be responsible for them. Yes, mm. that's very true. And then there's also the people who, who simply uh, who feel that when things are hard, so, for example, when there is a lot of pressure from external forces, then it is legitimate to make choices that for the sole purpose of alleviating that difficulty in the moment. So you could call it mor moral, um, 
there, there's a problem with moral consistency there, isn't there? Yes. So when, when their own pain or seemingly even, it might not even be that they are in pain, that it might be that they perceive there might be some future pain in mm-hmm. <laughs> taking that action. Mm-hmm. And then, like you say, there's a giving up of moral God's moral code for the sake of their own, for the sake of su- what they classify as saving themselves or, or se- some selfish endeavour. Yes, yeah. or giving up the, the idea that they have a choice in that moment. Yeah. Yeah. So this is what I notice um, when it comes to, again, if we now use a scenario where there is a person on earth and for example, they have a very bright spirit guide who's attempting to um, influence them in a loving direction. There may also be quite dark spirits, uh, so spirits with very unloving aspirations, both for the person, for themselves and for the world, um, attempting to influence that person. And what I notice is that there are, there are moments let's use first the negative sense, where the person may be in a situation and this dark, darker influence is acting very strongly upon them. So, for example, they're faced with a choice in a personal relationship, for example, and there is a lot of influence and pressure upon the person to, to say, oh, this person is really treating you mean and really they're unreasonable and really you should, you know, you should defend or attack yourself rather than critically analyse what's happening. And because the person feels so uncomfortable with that pressure, they decide, look, I'm not going to be responsible for what I do now I'm just going to lash out at that person. And then when I'm confronted later, even I might later even reflect on what I've done and I realise that, goodness, I abandoned my reasoning thought at Mm. that moment, to then say, well, that was the fault of the influence that I was under (laughs) rather than saying, no, I just simply wanted to avoid the discomfort that I was experiencing in that moment. And I made a choice to alleviate that because very often dark spirits do withdraw once you comply with their wishes. So a decision to just alleviate personal comfort for any reason really boils down to an underlying selfishness, doesn't it? It Really, it's like a selfish desire to avoid some moral uh, firmness or some moral code or moral standard or loving standard. Correct, correct. But I feel this analogy is is quite um, important for your listeners. Sure. So, because I would now like to give the example in the reverse. So, there does come times for people who do have some level of aspiration towards living in harmony with God's love or truth, or even some aspiration for personal truth and personal development in love, where they attract a spirit guide who has who has quite a bright condition and that spirit guide will be constantly attempting to prompt that person towards what is loving and truthful because that is in harmony with their aspiration Uh, but what i notice happens what we commonly notice happens in those situations is as you are very well aware the pressure from the external environment, from the earth environment upon Mm. that person, very often mounts. It becomes very unpleasant for the person. Uh, It's bringing up emotions for them which must be released. And uh, if they are to continue to develop this aspiration and continue towards becoming uh, more in harmony with God's love and truth and laws, uh, so it is a natural process and the, the guides, uh, the, the spirits attempting to influence uh, have, are, are assisting that person uh, to, in that progression. But very often the discomfort for the individual, again, is heightened. is heightened and they make a decision. In harmony with what the world wants rather than... Yes, yeah. with the exact same motivation to to Selfishly alleviate some personal emotion <laughs> yes to alleviate personal discomfort or fear <clears throat> or, or or some unpleasant grief or, or something uh, a willingness to to let go of reason 
in order to to simply avoid. And so I felt that was an interesting example because I know that many of your listeners don't consider the latter part of it. Yes, and what I'm noticing is that when the, the, some of our listeners who get some positive influences, they begin to engage the positive influences because it stirs their desire in the soul, you know, yes. to do things in harmony with love and truth. And there is a lot of love that comes from As a result, these influences. And they feel yes. that, you know, so they feel, and they also feel quite um, buoyant and enthusiastic excited, and yes. excited in that moment. But then they get the this pressure from the rest of the world, if you can call it that. And also, obviously, any negative spirits that are familial will also put pressure on them as well. And, and when they start feeling that pressure, that it's almost then that they have a tendency to blame the, the guide who's the lovely guide yes. helping them for the, the state they're in now of receiving pressure, <laughs> this negative <laughs> pressure from the external environment. And, and I find that this, attribu- this attributing the uh, result to an incorrect cause is having a large effect on people listening to divine truth because because they're basically blaming god or, or or positive influences for the state they now find themselves in mm-hmm. and and this is in particular case and, and the reason if we can tie this back into your family situation this is particularly the case with family situations mm-hmm. because a, a lot of the influence if your family is still alive on earth a lot of the influence coming from the family is going to be to uphold the family construct, the, yes. the, the beliefs and systems of the family. And so when they get these nice positive influences from these spirits, it's almost like the family sort of they have some upset with them about that. And instead of saying, well, no, I'm going to uphold this positive influence that I'm getting from these spirits mm-hmm. and I'm going to go ahead with that uh, thing that's making me feel buoyant and enthusiastic and I'm really, you know, excited to do that. Instead of doing that, they choose to reject the, the beautiful spirit who's helping them mm-hmm. and reject any truth that they may receive at the hands of others on earth who observe this occurring and instead reconnect to the very people who are holding them in a, in like almost in a prison-like state. Yes. Uh, just because of that, their, their fear, and it all, all, all comes down to their unwillingness to not feel some unpleasant emotions from the family. Exactly. Yeah. This is a... incredibly common, and I feel yeah. very pleased to have been able to discuss this with you today mm. because it, it is very common. Uh, firstly, this idea that influence is either solely negative or solely positive, mm. which is in most cases completely not, not untrue. Really true. And really the desire for that kind of um, viewpoint comes from a resistance to personal discernment. Resistance to make, take responsibility for one's own choices. Exactly. Yes. And then the latter example also with the, the desire to, to avoid the discomfort, the disparity between the condition of the spirit and the condition of the environment or Mm. the condition within oneself, which is what is more the case, um, to avoid the tension between that, causing a person to not only give up any sense of ethics or morality, but also there is that tendency to deny personal responsibility for choices in that that instance. And that that is not how it is viewed and not how it is computed by God's laws. Yeah. And you would have observed over the time that we've been uh, teaching on earth how like tens of thousands of people have heard divine truth and yet many of them, it, they have that initial buoyant spirit and initial enthusiasm and, and wonder for all the things that they're learning only to have these personal things, these personal experiences start occurring yes. where, where there's external pressures brought to bear. And under those circumstances, um, many times they crumble. And, and in fact, many times they look then upon what they heard from divine truth as the worst thing that's ever <laughs> happened in their life. Yes. Rather than seeing it, it, it as just exposing what is already the worst thing in their life, which is the, the current you know, negative influence that's preventing them their growth in love. Yes, and much of the, the vitriol or the, the very dark, uh, or a very pronounced rejection of 
of divine truth in those cases. It, it does come about in part because once truth is exposed to a person, be it personal or universal, it is difficult to deny that yes. again. Yes. It is difficult. It is possible, but difficult. Difficult, and it's possible, but only by a severe ex- suppression of your emotional condition, which actually creates a lot of personal harm and, and even health problems. Yes, so, and, and that is why people who have been exposed to divine truth for a period and then withdraw often find it far more difficult than those who have a momentary like, engagement yeah, and withdrawal. A few, they listen to a few presentations and then they're gone sort of thing, yeah. Yeah, so uh, that's unfortunate. And it, and what I feel with regard to, in terms of your own example there is, again, this desire to recognise and, and feel the pain that you feel mm-hmm. and be honest about it uh, rather than... And be honest about where it came from. And this is... In our first discussion with you yesterday, we were talking about this sense of logic that you had, mm-hmm. being, being honest with yourself about where this pain is coming from. And, and this is where I see many um, are not doing that. They, they are not being honest that the pain is not coming from God or, or from God's laws or from, or from uh, mm-hmm. good influences, from loving influences. But the pain is coming from this underlying choice and decision internally that we make to resist our feelings about such things. Yes. Yeah, and that's, uh, I feel, a big, a big factor. Very much. So if we can return back to your mum in terms of our discussion, cause, and that was a good segue because we, we, we needed to sort of, uh, we do need to, in the discussion, help people understand how things work from a soul-based perspective, don't yes. we, more and more, if, yes. it, if it's, that's possible. But returning to uh, your mum as a part of this discussion, and where is your mum now in her progress? She's, she's in the third sphere, yes, and um, learning a great many lessons. She, she has now an interest in God and God's way, or having a connection with God, but it's still under development. She's in the the more the upper regions of the third sphere. So has your mum met her soulmate yet? They have met. They have met. I'm unsure that they, again, if they... Where they understand they are soulmates. Yes. Yes. And they're not in a relationship. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And so... A a conscious relationship. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Obviously... um, we we're, were always in the non-conscious one <laughs> with our soulmate. But many of our listeners might find that interesting too because many of our listeners have this sort of concept that if family members all took up the, you know, the process of progress, you know, mm-hmm. then, then they would do it. And, mm. and, and I feel that that's also a fairly inaccurate way of seeing things in terms of life. You, you have progressed to the ninth sphere you didn't need any other family member to be in front of you to progress to that condition. But also the fact that you have progressed that condition and yet your mum, who really loves you, has not, is also an indication that, you know, obviously there's something going on with her feelings and desires that have caused her progress to not be as rapid. Yes, and that is a very interesting point, isn't it? Many people believe that the strength in numbers that that things will be easier and specifically because there is so much of this family paradigm uh, where people view themselves as part of a family unit for so long on earth and after they pass many people believe that if if only my family shared my desires or beliefs then things would be easier but my life would be better yes yeah. <laughs> but this is really in direct avoidance of even the the very basic truth that god created each of us as an individual soul and we are all his children not our parents children (laughs) yes and not only that that was really not my meaning while that is true true. um my meaning was more that uh that the group cannot do for the individual what the individual must do for themselves very important yeah very important and that is the case in so many that is the truth in relation to so many things 
Um, but the, the, on Earth, certainly, there is a large belief that the group can engender something with the, or, or make easier something for the individual, that, that there are certain things that only the individual can develop in themselves. It's true that influence exists, and yes. it's true, just as we spoke, between the Earth and the spirit life, Spirits do influence people in, in a variety of ways mm. and that influence can assist us to develop certain desires and that it, we can also say influence exists on the earth and that can assist or make it seem harder for us to develop desires in certain directions. Mm. But in essence, the development of desire must come from the individual and even if all conditions around the individual, be they spiritual or physical, are in harmony with a loving desire. If that individual does not wish to make changes and confront personal things within themselves, and de- which is really what is involved in developing desire, uh, then no change will take place and they, they will not develop that desire. And that is the wonderful thing about the spirit life is that it, it, your environment is a reflection of the, the level of your desire in any particular direction at any given time. Yes, I think that's the problem that most people seem to have on earth, isn't it? That they're not able to accurately measure via their feelings um, what, what the environmental condition is after they make changes. And so what they do is they have a habit then of measuring it by sight you know by the material matters and and unfortunately that then causes them to believe that even when they have made some progress they're not really sure they have made some progress or they feel uncertain or even sometimes you know feel like they haven't made any progress yes uh, and and so forth and that has an influence on them it does and i'm (laughs) laughing because i'm i'm remembering an example that i gave through mary a little while ago about the situation where uh a person develops a desire in a positive direction, much as, as we've been speaking about, and they, they face a lot of opposition from a family who doesn't have aspirations towards love. Mm. They, they have aspirations towards greed or selfishness, for example. And the person, instead of feeling that as they step away from that family and that influence, instead of feeling, this is this is wonderful. I now, I'm now not experiencing in my day-to-day life as much opposition. Yeah. Uh, they feel instead a great sense of loss and injustice that they don't have a family. Yeah, yeah. And so that this is where, again, with personal humility, yeah. that, that feeling would soon pass from the person and they would see things more clearly. But, but people don't measure progress very accurately. And it, and, it, and it seems again like in your, in your life on earth, you at least had, again, this illogical pro- appro- approach connected to your emotion mm. where you could at least measure, ah, oh, yeah, what my dad wants me to do, that, that is not going to be good. You know, that, that, that's not going to be good for me, but it's not good for the world either. And yeah, you had the ability that because of that self-analysis to, to see that. And this is what I notice is a lot of people they're willing to throw away that logical, truthful approach with themselves mm-hmm. in order just to avoid a specific emotion that they're trying to get away from. Yes, and, and, and the, the measurement of change is, yeah, yeah. is affected. And, yeah. And, uh, and perhaps, yes, uh, yeah. Um, but the, the point you were wishing to make, wasn't it, was that regardless of one's family, one must make choices and develop aspirations and it doesn't matter whether your family are ahead of you in terms of development in love or behind you in terms of Mm -hmm. development in love you will still have to make your own choices and decisions and i feel that's what a a lot of people don't really get yet Mm -hmm. uh, who are listening to us they still sort of believe that if they associate with a holy bird nice people then it make their life easier but but oftentimes what it does is it has this sort of negative impact in some ways in that in the, you don't develop your own faith and your desire enough. Uh, you're reliant on the group mentality mm-hmm. or the group desire in order to accomplish things. And we notice this a lot in God's way, as you yes. know, where, where certain individuals are reliant. They want to feel the good, the good that the group does mm-hmm. and feel that that's great that they did that. But really, 
But really, their personal desire is not yet into that aspirational place where they would have done it. If, mm-hmm. if, if they had no one yes. assisting them, would they have still done it? And, and I feel uh, with your life, you, you've demonstrated in your life on earth that you were willing to do it even if no one agreed with you. Mm. And I feel this is a very important uh, trait, almost like a character trait that we need to develop as individuals, that, that we will do what we know to be loving and right, even even if nobody else agrees with us. Yes. Of course, the, the secret is determining what's loving and right. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, that's correct. Yeah, because yes. a lot of times we, we think what's loving and right is of, of oftentimes, you know, what our parents thought was loving and right, which is often just addiction and from God's perspective wrong. So with your, with your mother then, you, um, from, a, from a, our listeners' perspective, many of them I think would be fairly surprised to hear that, that she was in the second sphere you know, in the early 1900s, and now today she's in the third sphere, and it's a hundred years later. Mm. And, and even though she passed not as, um, you know, in a, as dark a condition as some others who who have gone from the first sphere to the celestial heavens in that time. Mm. Yeah. Yes, but my mother is very happy, and and she is working on her progress, and she she's quite interested in service of others. And so she does a lot of things in her life to assist others. But yes, yeah. that's, that's, where she, that's where her aspiration and desire has led her to this point. Well, I suppose like you said in that initial discussion about mum, um, her desire for God has been the thing yes. that uh, has probably been neglected, isn't it? Yes. And, and that's, that's what right. she's now developing. And that's, yeah. that is a wonderful... As I spoke about earlier in the mm. discussion, this yearning for God mm-hmm. is vastly underestimated in terms of how it impacts upon the speed of one's progress yeah. in the spirit life. And as many people also probably wouldn't understand as well, that by the time you reach the second sphere, there is a, can, and can be a tendency towards uh, having a very relaxed approach <laughs> to, to, to not, not in a... It's probably that's, a better way of saying it. Isn't that's it? correct. Yeah. Yes, yes. So it, when you're in the ninth sphere, and this is something a, a personal question for yourself, when you're in the ninth sphere, when you go back to the third, how does it feel for you? <laughs> well, how long have you got? <laughs> uh, I feel uh, there's a simple way, perhaps, to answer that question. Yeah. Um, but as I say, I could speak for many hours, really, about the differences and, yeah. and why those differences exist. It feels restrictive to, yeah. to return there. And, why, and there is a, a very great sensitivity, not only to the love that does exist there, but also the, the undeveloped love or the unexpressed love in, in such a location and the error the, the, or... Yeah, because it really is still error in the second sphere. Yes, I just pause because it's not quite the right word that Mary used, but mm. it, it is, uh, this is why I say it, and when I say that I could speak for many hours, perhaps it is more correct to say that I could not possibly convey really the difference. I think for your listeners, it is best to say that it feels very limiting and restrictive. The, the location in the ninth sphere is so expansive and so, uh, yes, expansive is a good word. It feels very encouraging of one's own expansion and mm. one's own desires and one's own expression. And, it is, it, and so returning to the third sphere feels as if you are entering a very narrow space. Uh, why, but... Because of the condition of the night sphere, one can cope with that narrowing. Because you've got that permanent connection with God. Yes. So it's not a distasteful uh, sense as much as it is a sensitivity to, to the to disparities it. or mm. to, the, to the nuances of everything that is occurring on a much more deeply aware level than anyone else who resides in that location is able to comprehend at that time. 
yeah, so we just had a break. <laughs> Mary and I need to go to the toilet. So we just had a break. And, and uh, so we'll have to just revisit from our perspective, <laughs> revisit the subject. We, we, I was asking you, Afra, about this issue regarding uh, your feelings when you visit the third sphere. And in particular, I wanted to focus on the feelings that you have when you're, when you're, in, the, uh, when you're in the ninth sphere and you're expressing your love for another person. How does that feel? in comparison to when you're in the third sphere and you're expressing the same kind of love that you have, but for somebody now in the third sphere, how does that feel? <laughs> and we'll do the same with truth as well in both places. Yes, it's a good question, my friend. It's a good question. It's, it's quite interesting the way that um, the soul works. And I'm reminded of the the love that God has for all of us at all times and and the fact that many of us in our earthly incarnation, myself being one of them, had no perception of that love that was coming towards me from God for my whole life. I, I hoped for it and I thought that it must be possible, but really I didn't receive it personally until I had entered the spirit life. And and some of the experiences you hear me describing in the books, uh, I was also receiving God's love at yes. those same times. Um, uh, and if I did receive any on earth, it was it was a very in a very minute way. It was not really in any conscious way. And so, uh, if we imagine that, then for example, and we imagine the love that is there from God for for everyone at all times, and and yet how few people actually are open to that love. It, it's a good place to start now when I begin to explain the, the difference from when I visit someone uh, from my current condition, which is, is not only very open to God's love or, or very much more open to God's love than, than anyone else in a sphere lower than myself, but I also have development in personal love, my love for others. And uh, so when I visit someone in the third sphere, like my mother, for example, um, I have an immense amount of love for her. And, and I have the joy of experiencing that love and expressing it to her uh, in her current location. But it is true to say that she cannot feel all of it. She cannot receive it fully, just like uh, those of us who are close to God's love, while it exists, we cannot, while it does exist, we cannot fully understand or when I say understand, I mean from an, from an emotional perspective mm. to, to, to fully receive that the gift of what is being offered uh, is not possible. And even I know in my current state that there's much more mm. opening for me to do to be able to, and, and you, you yourselves are demonstrations uh, in your soul unified state of what is possible. Um, and so I, I hope that that analogy can, might can help I go a bit some further into it? to yeah. understand, yes, yeah. um, what it is like. So when I visit my mother, mm. She, she, can, she can have a knowledge that I love her and even at times be overwhelmed by that. Um, she's not yet fully able to receive the, the, the quality of the amount of love that I have for her. Yeah. And I suppose what I was trying to do there is focus on your feelings about that. Like, it, mm -hmm. like um, what, what, what are, this is something I notice a lot on earth where... where um, we, we love a person and we're trying to assist the person and, and we really love, you know, expressing the truth of the person. But it's like uh, a lot of the times uh, what I feel from the person is like uh, sometimes I even think you hate them you know, like yeah. while, while you love them, you know what I mean? It's, yes. it's, it's such a contrast. I, I suppose what I'm trying to illustrate to our listeners is that um, there's this. There's the receiving of love, isn't there? Mm -hmm. Which, which is generally, uh, basically, the receiving of love is all about your capacity to allow yourself to be overwhelmed. <laughs> really, <laughs> that's what it really gets down yes. to. Yes. And um, your willingness, really, to allow the overwhelming feeling. When you're receiving love from a person in a higher condition, it it will always feel overwhelming. 
if you fully allow the feeling. And what I notice is that most people don't allow that. So that's on the, that's on the receiving end. Mm -hmm. But on the giving end, there's this sort of feeling. It's not a, it's not a feeling of, uh, I suppose you could call it a feeling of sa sa satiating. Is that the best English word? Yeah, it's not Where satisfying. It, it doesn't feel the full expression of your love has been satisfied through the exchange. Yes. Like, so when you're, in this, when you're in the night sphere and you're sharing your love with another person and they receive it, you feel like they, you are satisfied that they have actually felt what you feel for them. Yes. And, and, and that they understand that that's how you feel for them. And, yes. and, the, and there is a special, unique quality to that, isn't there? Of, yes. Of being able to transmit a feeling of love to another person and they actually understand how much you love them. And, and then to go to a person who's, who's in a position where they're resisting love still, when you give, you feel that same amount of love for them still, but but you know that they don't feel what you're feeling for them, and 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 therefore there is this sort of feeling inside of you of oh, where's this extra love that I got <laughs> going? You know, where can it go where to? Can it go to? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. perhaps not. Yeah, it's perhaps not correct to say no. I feel a sense of 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 uh, unspent yeah, emotion or un un unexpressed emotion. No, because you are expressing it fully. Yes. Yeah. But there is a sense that it, it hasn't been received. And while I don't feel sad about that, uh, it, it, yes, you're right. There is some level of, it's difficult to describe, isn't it? It's yeah, not it's, it's, dissatisfaction, but in terms of an unhappy emotion or an unpleasant emotion. But no. it is an awareness of... Of the limitation. The limit, yes. Yeah. The limit within the person... And it does feel to, do, to, to a degree like... I'm not able to share with this person how I really feel about them. Mm. And, and, and so there is that consciousness that they're not really understanding yes. uh, what you really feel for them, yeah. isn't there? Yes. And one of the beautiful things I feel about being in the celestial heavens is, is this whole thing that goes on when you do share your love with another person in that location, that mm. they, to a large degree, depending on of course their condition but to a large degree they accept the full full amount of the love that you're expressing and so therefore you know they understand what they're feeling from you to to mm. a large extent it's something that i that i hope for or that i long for with claire because yeah. as yet we don't uh, yeah. we are while i can do that in a brotherly sense with other people here yeah um I long for that satisfied feeling when we share a condition and yeah, are yeah. able to express love for each other in a in, in a the, very fulfilled way. Yes, yeah, in this sort of where where you're really you could say and uh, and again we've got to be careful about choice of English words, but sort of like you're in an equal condition where you can receive the amount of love that is being given. Um, and that, that is a very beautiful experience. Mm. And, and I don't think anyone really on earth really understands how beautiful that experience can be because it, uh, and therefore understand the beauty of the celestial heavens because mm. it, it's sort of like beside there being all these beautiful external things, <laughs> there's, the, more, the, the larger beauty of that experience is, that, is, the, is the experience of what goes on internally, yes. isn't it? And, uh, most and, certainly. And that is the, the condition... And that's why it doesn't feel unpleasant. It, yeah. While I said it feels like a narrowing to enter the third sphere again, yeah. to, to visit. Um, but it doesn't feel unpleasant because I carry my condition. It, 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 that is me. And so yeah. it, it, while it, again, it's difficult to But there describe. is the knowledge still that the person can't receive what you're giving them. I, I suppose yes. a, bit, a good way to liken it physically from an from a, a illustration perspective would be Pouring water in the bottle that's already full. Yes. <laughs> it yes. just spills out everywhere. You're still pouring it, it's still flowing, but it just yes. spills out everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't go in the bottle. <laughs> yes. And, yeah. and if I could clarify the sense, because um, uh, I, I just said that it feels unpleasant to enter the third sphere. It, it, there, it, I would like to convey. It's more limitation than restriction, isn't it? Yes. Very unpleasant. Well, I yes. Because internally you still feel good. 
Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> yes. Yeah. So this is what I was wanting to say. Sure. That, that um, the surroundings can feel, can can be sensed as unpleasant, but I myself do not feel unpleasant yeah. internally. Yeah. Yeah. So I sense, as you, as you correctly say, the limitation and so forth. And I think in the pageant messages where spirits who have come from higher spheres to the earth or something, they, they've often expressed, oh, you don't realise how unpleasant it is for us to be here. I think a lot of times the readers of those messages get the wrong idea about what that means because, it, because a lot of it's about the fact that you're expressing this condition of love that you have, but it's just not, you know, you can feel that, that it, the, the limitation and restriction on the receiving end and how that's, and I often think about that from God's perspective, how he feels the limitation and restriction on our receiving ends, you know, yeah. in terms of how, how, that, how our relationship with God is often mirrored by, by that, you know, where God has this unlimited amount of love to give and, and then we have a restricted version of, of how much we can receive. Yeah, it's a, it's a wonderful thing that you, that you bring up for discussion. The second thing I'd like to talk about in the same sort of relation is the attitude towards truth. So how does it feel when you're sharing truth with another person in the celestial heavens, in particularly in the same sphere as yourself? Well, <laughs> very similar, very mm-hmm. similar to the love-based exchange. In fact, here in the celestial heavens, there, there really isn't a, a, a difference between sharing truth and sharing love exactly. in terms of our interactions. It's, yeah. And, and much of the communication, just for the benefit of your listeners, is not done in a verbal sense of anyway. Course. And mm. so uh, for those of you who, who will be thinking that way, it's, it's not like that. So, but I understand where you're headed, which is to compare that to the, to the communication in the lower spheres, mm. especially the spheres mm. before the eight mm. where uh, at one moment has not been reached. Mm-hmm. And yes, the, because obviously there, the, the so the third sphere, there there's a lot of um, truth that is absent mm-hmm. from from that location in mm-hmm. terms of the the universal truth, the personal truth in individuals. It's not absent in the sense that it doesn't exist, but it's absent from the awareness of those individuals living there. That is, that's correct because truth is not absent in the third in any sphere. location, any of any of God's truth, even in the hells. <laughs> that's that's correct. That's correct. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. let's be very clear. Yeah. Yes, that's right. Um, it's it is just that the the individuals in the third sphere are not as open, just like that bottle you referred to, um, to truth as those of us in the ninth sphere who, who we celebrate it, we, we yearn for it, we love it, we rejoice in it. Um, those a party, you know, it's, yes. it's, a, you know, it's like, it's like yes. a, par- a party if you receive some more truth. Yes. <laughs> and what I noticed, that's why I'm asking is because I noticed in the lower spheres, obviously, but if we think about it here on earth, it's like for most people on earth when they receive truth, it's a it's a major trauma. <laughs> That's how they see it. You know, that instead of having a party, they want to have a, <laughs> what do you call it when you mourn, you know, like a funeral. <laughs> yes, it's very unpleasant for them and shocking and yeah. many things, yeah. many things. Yeah. yeah. So, so in the third sphere, it's, it, there, is a, there is some awakening to truth in the third sphere, as yes. you know, or, or it, it's not so much an awakening to truth, but an awakening to the importance of truth. And this is wonderful. I, I enjoy visiting the third sphere very much. Because people are just right in their first throes of wanting truth. <laughs> yes, and understanding how crucial truth is to development of any kind and, yeah. and really coming to have a love for truth. And so I, I love visiting the third sphere for that reason. But, yeah. but obviously the truth that I can convey that will be received yes. or even understood <laughs> or understood is limited and so i do find that i i do limit myself to conveying the truth that is the next best truth for for that, for that person. person uh and that will be understood uh readily and so that that, that person can uh continue to progress so there is a limitation again 
uh, that you refer to. Yeah, and, I, and the joy of living in the celestial heavens about this celebration of truth, you know, yes. that, uh, you know, that's something that is really is not present in other spheres, is it really? It's, like, like to, it's in various degrees it's present, but, yeah. but this whole celebration of any truth is not present. And um, the, the absence of fear assists... Oh, is greatly, this the, of course. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It is really only the, the presence of fear that causes people to resist truth and to feel truth is unpleasant yes. and to, to avoid truth or deny truth or fight with truth or see truth as an attack, any of those yeah. things, that, that is because fear is present. Yeah. And so um, obviously after we reach the at-one-ment state, that fear is no longer there. And so the, the full joy that can be experienced um, through the receipt of truth is um, un, unimpeded. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so. And so it's, it's a wonderful thing. And yeah. ov- obviously, um, as you know, I've had a, a love of truth since my days on earth. Yes. And, um, so you must be enjoying that. Yeah, very much. <laughs> very, very much. <laughs> Yeah, no, that's that's uh, how I how I felt about it too. It's like the the and I, and that's one thing I am struggling about here on Earth, mm-hmm. uh, living here on Earth, it, it, in terms of just how much uh, joy I get sharing truth, and then comparing that with how much <laughs> sorrow everybody seems to feel <laughs> receiving it. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. I I feel for you and and. And it's somewhat different, isn't it? Because you, you're not dealing with individuals on purpose. You're dealing with uh, sharing as much truth as possible in order to benefit as many people and understanding that each person will be led to their next best truth amongst what you have yeah, created. Sure. And, uh, but we and do so have those personal interactions too, though, with people, and that's where we really notice it. Yes. <laughs> that, the, you notice the, the, the fear being resisted. and Yeah, and the, you know, not, not seeing truth. It, it's, it's hard in personal interactions with people because it's like internally, because of that feeling that we have of, you know, enjoying the truth so much and, and seeing its, its extreme importance, you know, it's a, a, as an aspect of love. And then, and then finding ourselves like sharing it because of that joy that you internally feel about it only to feel the person's terror and sorrow (laughs) (laughs) about what they're receiving and and, uh yeah it's a it's a um it's sort of difficult after being in the condition where you're in the ninth sphere or or higher where you where you're able to share this truth like as a party (laughs) yes and where it is understood what a what a gift it is it is yeah yes and how much everybody really wants it too you know because there's a strong longing in everybody really for it and then and then to come here again and and feel that contrast it's quite extreme and and uh, And how interesting for yourself I, i i understand that i have compassion for the fact that what you share it exposes so much fear and resistance and uh, um, in people that you, you're often the brunt of quite a lot of anger. Yeah. But how interesting for yourself that there, there, there's so much in our discussion today, isn't there, about the disparity between states or the disparity between certain things. So uh, what I was reflecting on as you were speaking was the the high level of truth that you have remembered and the the fact that fear still exists within yourself Mm -hmm. also Mm -hmm. whereas for myself um much of what you understand in your current condition i only came to understand when i was in a, a state that was free of fear and so i've feel for you with this disparity yeah, really no, it, even it, in your it's, own condition isn't it yeah it is it's, it's quite tricky personally uh because you've got to be prepared to go through it's, it's a real strange conundrum in some ways because it's like you have this really deep enthusiasm and joy about the truth generally and, and also even personally but but then there are specific things that obviously emotionally still exist in you that, fears and and uh you know grief and other feelings that exist within you that you resist and 
then so when you receive some of it personally you've got this oh isn't it great that oh, isn't it really bad <laughs> and but what i notice generally with people on earth the general attitude is oh it's just really bad <laughs> it's, it's, there's yes. not much to come under them it's just yeah. it's just uh really bad and i suppose the reason why i asked the question was because i wanted to help our listeners understand the the feeling of being able to share love and truth uh, at the level you already have it, mm. it is a very beautiful uh, part of a, being a you know person who's at, at one with God, isn't it? It's a, yes. It, it's like there's there's all these other beautiful things, but that uh, you know there's there's so many things in that personal experience. It's something that you you miss a great deal. Yeah, it is. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah. It's sort of like this. Um, and, and you know, I still have some grief to feel about it, even uh, as you know, because you know, because you know, you receive you, there's something that brings you so much joy, and you share with another person, and all they want to do is harm you because of it. <laughs> <laughs> it's sort of like what's, what's going on in here? Yeah, there's a high, uh, you know a bit of not confusion, but you know, internally, emotionally, sort of, go, what's going on there? Right? Mm. When it's such a lovely thing to you, you know, mm. and and I, I wanted to illustrate that too from the point of view of People being in the same condition share love and truth the same way. So even if you're in the hells, you're sharing love and truth the same way, mm -hmm. and that's why you're in the same condition together. Yes. But, but when you're in a different condition, sharing love and truth changes in the way you share it because it, obviously the different condition means more, more love and more truth can be shared. Mm -hmm. And the lower condition means that you're still resisting that love and truth to a large degree. Mm -hmm. And the key is, I find, to 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 uh, I'm still working out how to help people teaching wise, to to allow that confrontational process in that lower condition to happen mm -hmm. emotionally. You know, to, to let yourself be overwhelmed by it, it without preventing it. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And it seems to me it's a bit like in your earth life. When you, you know, when you acknowledge the truth that your dad didn't really love you, mm -hmm. for example, mm -hmm. that's a painful truth it is. initially because you had emotions. You want him to love you and there's all the other emotions associated with that. But once you release that, it's no longer a painful truth, mm -hmm. is it? It's, like, it's only because there's emotions to release that it was a painful truth in the first place. But you allowed the even the acknowledgement of it, even though you hadn't yet really gone through the release of it. Yes. And, and this is what I'd like to encourage our listeners to do mm. uh, as well, just to, even if you don't go through the emotion of, you know, the painful emotion that you have to come to terms with by acknowledging the truth, at least love the fact that you got the truth um, because that, that's the thing that's going to free you. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> I yeah. couldn't say it better myself. Yeah. That's, a, that's a very important thing, isn't it? Yeah, and I, I suppose I wanted to sort of illustrate to our listeners a bit how you felt when you are in that more restricted environment mm. compared to being in this unrestricted environment where you're allowed to share all the truth you have and that truth is just like a constant party. <laughs> yes, it is a constant party. Yeah. And I suppose I feel the very cyclical nature of uh, living here in the night sphere where love and truth are so readily given and accepted by everyone it feels that my joy can grow unimpeded and and can build even mm. uh, whereas uh, when it comes to to being in the third sphere and communicating with people there I feel I still have a lot of joy in, in relation to love and to truth and mm. and being in harmony with those things and even expressing those things even though they may not be fully received by the person I'm communicating with, it still brings me a lot of joy. But there is no sense of, or there is a lessened sense, I suppose, of the, there's a sense that the joy has not reached its full potential because mm. uh, when a gift is fully received, uh, there, there is its own joy in that, isn't there? Yes, it's, a, it's sort of like, isn't it, a, it's sort of a deep level of satisfaction that comes from both of you knowing that you understand each other properly. Yes. And, and this is the beautiful thing about the relationship with God, isn't it, that you know God understands you completely even if nobody else does. And, yeah. And, uh, and once you come to terms with that, 
emotionally, you will have a higher likelihood of just being yourself anyway, uh, uh, because you, cause, because it's very satisfying to have ha, to have to be known as you are know, as you know. Mm-hmm. Um, is probably the best way of saying it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Anyway, uh, we didn't get to anything to do with the books, really, did we? But <laughs> <laughs> but I uh, but I think this discussion about feelings and emotion, and we we covered what we've covered basically is. The discussion, uh, it was uh, uh, little bits of discussion around your parents mm-hmm. and the reason why we had that discussion was that I wanted to illustrate how even though your parents had s- certain set conditions inside of themselves, that didn't have to predetermine your condition and your, and your experience in the spirit world. In fact, because of your self-reflection and your desire for truth, it, it didn't determine and in fact, their development is being determined by their condition and their and their desires, yes. and your condition and development is being determined by your development and desires. Yes. And to have people understand that properly is a very important thing, I think, because once they understand that, they realise every time you blame somebody else for your lack of progress in love and truth, every time you blame somebody else for, you know, who, whether it's a spirit or people on earth, Every time you blame somebody else for restricting you or whatever, you're really out of harmony with the truth. And that, and that truth is, no, you are personally capable of being in whatever condition you wish to be in as long as you have desire. And, and I think that's really good that we, we talked about that. Yes, yeah, so, um, thank you very much for our discussion today. Yeah. It hasn't, I, I feel that the content of what I've wanted to say has come through reasonably well. There is the issue of... Your emotional feelings <laughs> coming through. <laughs> yes, yeah. where Miriam sometimes restricts those because of other emotions that she's uh, resisting within herself. Uh, and so perhaps the, the level of my humour and joy doesn't always uh, come through. Come through. Yeah. Yes, well, but... Mary's not feeling very uh, humorous lately, <laughs> which is understandable given the different things she's feeling. So. So I'm still glad that we had the opportunity to have a chat. And uh, uh, thank you yeah. very much for. And it. we will get to the subjects of the books because I, I do want to discuss them. Uh, you know, we may, we may just spend an hour or two on each one because mm-hmm. I don't know if there's a we do need to have really deep discussions about them. But I want to discuss them uh, mostly because I, I want you to give you I want to give you the opportunity to correct anything you'd like corrected, <laughs> and also like to. Um, talk about the influence of the medium on the the transmission of what you wanted to transmit at the time uh, as as two particular things we'd like to discuss in the future with you about about the series of books that you did transmit through robert that would be my pleasure yeah thank you okay well thanks for your time and uh, and and uh, please uh is hex claire being with us all this time as well uh, I don't not, think not so. For me. No, 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 that's good. No, I don't want to. <laughs> but we we would like to have a discussion with Claire as well about her response to what happened when after she met you in the spirit world, yes. and also a little bit about her life on Earth as well. Mm-hmm. Um, just to you know, and her feelings about her life on Earth as well, if we can. Yeah. Uh, so that. There are the two areas of discussion we wouldn't mind proceeding with in the future if we can. Certainly. Yeah. It would be my pleasure. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, thanks Afra. All right. Well, hopefully, uh, everyone, you've enjoyed that conversation. And, and Mary and I, uh, it was pretty hot in this room because we had the heater on rather than the cooler on. <laughs> so it's pretty warm. Um, so, uh, yeah, we need to have a break and, yeah. and, and, and finish off. But uh, hopefully you've enjoyed some of that conversation. I think there's a lot of things, isn't there? to learn from these contrasting of different conditions. Mm. And, and this is one thing that we've been trying to do lately in our mediumship and in terms of helping you understand some of the things we're teaching because you can see from our discussions with our spirit friends that quite often they can kind of contrast one of the conditions they were in with what the condition they are in now and then able to, they're able to uh, illustrate better to you what it means to make progress in God's way. Mm. Yeah. 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 And I thought it was, um, it was quite an, for what I, you know, I had my own processes <laughs> going on at certain points, but um, I thought some of the, I, I was fascinated by just how 
passionate Afro I was about some of those things yeah. uh, and, and how important it felt it was for our viewers to hear some of those things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. All right, well, we'll probably look into our main cam now and say, say see you later, everybody. Hopefully, um, you, uh, uh, it's highly unlikely we're going to be doing a lot more uh, of recordings this year because we're still way behind with our preparation with the assistance groups. So what we're prob- trying to do is to help our new trainees in our switching and, and cut note or a chapterizing processes to get their exposure to that. But it's uh, we're probably only going to be doing three or four more presentations by the end of this year mm-hmm. because we have so much work we have to do to get the sin or understanding sin and its causes assistance group prepared for you. So we, we'd like to remind you that you can always go back to the other the other material we've already done, and also very soon there's going to be a lot of material coming out, which is all uh, short clips of mm. of a lot of the stuff we've done into sort of shorter bite-sized chunks. So so many of you have not watched all of our presentations of now. There's thousands of hours, so it'd be highly likely that most of you haven't watched all of that. And you may enjoy instead going to the clip process, clips channel. to the clips channel to do that. So we're and hoping over the next few months to get that underway and operational. Yeah, uh, that's, I'm very excited for that because it will mean, won't it, that we can actually have a clips channel which has got shorter videos on it some of them five or ten minutes long um but within the title um you'll find certain themes so you can search rather than watch a whole presentation that might cover a lot of different topics you can Mm -hmm. search for just one specific thing and i i'm excited for that that it'll help people um i feel yeah and then then as a part of that later we're, we're still developing our database engine so that will mean that it's all searchable as well. So that it, of course it'll be immediately searchable via the Clips via channel, YouTube, yeah. yeah, via YouTube, um, and Vimeo, but and Google and Google, yeah. yeah. But um, we want to have it. Uh, Jesus is working very hard on you know bringing you a searchable function on the website itself. Yeah, that's right. So so that it brings up all of the material pertaining to specific subjects. So th- that's what we're doing. We're very busy at the moment. We've got a lot of things going on with God's Way. We've got buildings, renovations going on um, in terms of in God's way, trying to get accommodation for people who come to help. And then we've also got a lot of uh, preparations to do for our assistance group. And so we're very, very busy. It's going to be a very busy period until probably May next year now. And uh, and so um, there won't be a lot of recordings coming out now between now and the end of the year. But after after the assistance group, obviously the entire assistance group will be shared with you at some point after that. So we look forward to doing all of those things, but there's a lot of work and prep to do. So, so you might not see too much new material from us over the coming months, but uh, hopefully enjoy the material that does come out. <laughs> so we'll, we'll, we'll see you again at another time. And, and for those of you who are coming to the assistance group, we look forward to seeing you there. And for those of you who are coming to the God's Way um, uh, volunteer, volunteer selection, selection program, uh, we look forward to seeing you there too. Yeah. There'll be five weeks or... Or three weeks contact of of yeah. some interesting things we're going on there which we're looking forward to. Of course to. this is all assuming that this video hits the internet before <coughs> before those, those, those dates, events happen. Yeah, <laughs> which yeah. might not happen. But well anyway. we, uh, we'll try. We, yeah. We're going to try to get them out but obviously there's a whole new team learning uh, yeah. new processes and and uh, you know so we there's a whole learning process that has to be gone through for all of that and yeah it's going to take time. <laughs> Everyone is a busy little worker bees around here at the moment. Yeah yeah. yeah. Anyway, thank you for your time today and and hopefully enjoy uh, the discussion with Afra. We'll have some more coming up soon. And uh, we look forward to seeing you the next time we do either channeling or some presentation.